Welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show here in Laurelton, New York, uh, and uh, joined by one of my heroes and a hero to many around the world, a pianist, gifted pianist, and actually an even better human being, George Cables. Welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Hi, Jake. Glad to be here. So good to see you, man. You know, I wanted to ask you about the effect of um, going from mono to stereo. The effect that it had on individual sound. Glenn Moore, the bass player, said that actually the sort of generalized thing about stereo sound is that it, it homogenized sound. So you lost that individual sound. Before that, with mono, everybody had their own sound. But I want your take on mono to stereo. I, I you know, I didn't have to deal with that because I was just listening when mono, uh, when stereo came out. So that wasn't a big problem for me personally as a player. But I don't I I don't really see that. I don't see how it changed. You have your sound as a player. When you have your sound as a player, you have your sound. 
uh, that's your sound. And however it's presented, uh, I don't think there's a player that changes much, you, you know. Different guys like, uh, say somebody, I'm thinking about somebody who uses the microphone. And a live performance, somebody like Joe Henderson. Right. Uh, I don't think, you know, his sound got bigger because of the way he used the mic. He used how to know how to, knew how to use the mic. So uh, I don't see how that is going to change his sound or his personality. For him, it just gave him a, a, maybe a sound a little bigger, but more presence. So I, How did he I, use the mic, by the way? This is really fascinating stuff. I don't, I just play the piano. <laughs> you, know, I don't, you know, that doesn't... You're you not know, going to speak for Joe. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. I just play the piano. I mean, Joe uses the mic because, he, you know, you see him put his bell right in, the, the mic right in the bell, or pull away, go get back closer. And, uh, um, and you know, for playing, you know, like for horn players, we like trumpet players, who, uh, you know, want to get close to the mic. You know, they do that because, uh, you know, they do that so they don't overblow, you know, like that. But I don't see, uh, I mean, it's not a problem that I have ever actually ever thought about. No, because you're one of the, I just feel like, even Reggie Workman said, I mean, again, we're talking about the Fender Rhodes, the, electric, the electrical component to, versus acousticity, that it, you somehow still found your individual sound on an electric piano. Well, I, uh, first of all, I liked, uh, you know, when it came to the roads, there was the suitcase model and the stage model. And, uh, um, uh, you know, some people liked that stage model that had a sort of brighter, uh, sharper sound. I don't mean sharper in pitch, but I mean in sharper in character. Right. Um, but I like that suitcase model because of the men had a really mellow sound and I had the vibrato that I liked. Um, and I mean, it was part of that, part of that was using the vibrato. And then part of that again, you know, I think the Rhodes and the piano have what they have in common is that when you play it, you, can, you touch the piano and even though it's a machine, it's a you know, it's sort of a little miracle. You know, these <laughs> little machines, you know, you. When you touch it, no matter who you are, it comes out differently. Some people, I mean, uh, have a more distinctive sound uh, 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 when they touch the piano. Some people, not not so much, but it's still, whatever you play, whoever you are, you have a different sound. Sometimes it's the what you play on the way you approach, and sometimes it's just how you touch the piano how you touch the instrument. And I think that is the beginning and the, and the foundation for me. And of course, what I play is, is a little different, you know, the way you approach it, the way I phrase, uh, um, and the way each of us phrases, each pianist phrases and what we play is a little different. But I think uh, for me, t uh, a touch in the instrument is very, very important. It responds to you. It's a percussion instrument, but it's one that it's not just about the volume and you touch it and it's a uniform sound. You can make it sing, you can make it, uh, you do sword sandals, you know, jump, uh, uh, hit it, hit the pedal, and take your hand off and uh, just have a kind of an echo sound. Oh. There are all kinds of things that you can do with the piano, but each person, the way they touch the piano, and I don't know the, the, the mechanics of why, why that is you know, with each person. It might be just the physical makeup of, of your hands, of your body, of the way you, the way you uh, hit the piano, the way you touch it. But um, touching the piano uh, can, you know, is a very individual thing. When, uh, when did you and Lenny White first meet? Because Lenny... Mm -hmm. uh, was going down at 13 with his dad and he was playing it with Jackie McLean. And I'm like, I, I feel like you were, had this, did you have a similar apprenticeship? I mean, uh, yeah, well, uh, Lenny, I met Lenny. I can't tell you the year. <laughs> no, it's been back. Like. It was maybe around 64, five, six, something like that. 19 in the sixties. And we, and, uh, I think we had, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure if we, 
were both involved with this thing called Jazz Interactions with uh, a competition. That's so why I met, I think I first met Steve Grossman and, uh, and Lenny, but we actually, maybe we met in this basement right here, because this used to be uh, my mother's house. Uh, it's possible that Lenny was in, in, in the basement. Oh, but that was, I'm, dude, Lenny was definitely in the basement. In the basement. He's definitely but, down in the but, basement. Dude. But I don't remember, you know, the first how we actually met, but we used to, uh, we had a neighborhood band, and uh, it was called the Jazz Samaritan. Right. And Billy Cobham was uh, one of them. It was uh, Artie Simmons, Bernard Scavella, uh, uh, Artie Simmons, Clint Houston, and myself, and Leroy Barton, and uh, and then uh, the band started changing, and uh, uh, after a while, um, you know, uh, Billy uh, had to go into the army. Uh, Billy Cobb had to go in the army, and, and but he was stationed in New York at the Brooklyn Army Terminal, so we go down there and, and do some. Uh, uh, some of us will go down and uh, play with the army. Uh, 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 Small combo or you no, know, no, with the big band, with, with big uh, band, like a re rehearsal band. Ah, oh, it's unbelievable, so, dude. Uh, but but in the meantime, he wasn't really here. So Lenny kind of got came on, was in the scene. Lenny was the next drummer, but by that time the band was sort of breaking up, was changing. Uh, and I don't know if Lenny was, I don't think Lenny was part of the Samaritan things, but Lenny and Steve Grossman and uh, and everybody, you know, like uh, Dave Lehman and my, our mothers, Dave's mother and my mother knew each other. Wow, from the wow. And, uh, um, well, you know what it was like the, Lenny's dad was instrumental in, in getting him, um, he wanted him, to, he, he was, a, he, he loved, uh, I think. Prez. He lived just right down the road. He so, did. He lived right down the road. So I mean, like, when when was George Cable's first bandstand experience? Who was the leader? Oh, well, let me see the band. You mean like? I mean, because like Lenny band. was on the bandstand at thirteen with Jackie McLean. Oh, yeah. I that I don't know. I, I didn't know that, but uh, that was not. I mean, I played. My apprenticeship was with the, the Jazz Samaritans. We would go and sit in and do things, and then. A great man. He's still around. Jim Harrison. Jim Harrison, uh, who uh, was uh, uh, who used to produce concerts, and he took an interest in young talent, and he, he liked. Uh, uh, he would. Uh, there was a place called Club Club Ruby, and he would have events where he'd have a rhythm section. Let's say of Jack Dijon, Ed McCoy, Tyner, and John Orr, or Cedar Walton and John Orr. And, and uh, Jack, uh, uh, let me see, uh, trying to, other drummers, uh, Jack was the first person that came to mind. Right, right. And then there would be, I don't know, a bunch of horn players, a bunch of, maybe it was all trumpets or saxophones. Uh, uh, and um, uh, so Jim took an interest in us, and uh, we were kind of, we got this rhythm stick, was Lenny and Clint and myself. And uh, uh, he hooked us up uh, with uh, for afternoons at Slugs, Saturday afternoons at Slugs, when uh, uh, we would uh, be the rhythm section for say three trumpets. Right. Wow. And then uh, um, maybe three saxophones, and then he hooked us up with. Uh, something at Westbury, where well, we were the the rhythm section for Woody Shaw and Booker Irvin, and uh, Woody kind of liked the way we played, so he got uh, Lenny hooked Lenny up with me and Lenny. We played with Jackie Mac at the uh, at the um, at at Slugs, and then there was another gig. I remember playing with uh, trying to think. Uh, Billy Mitchell, I think. I uh, get slugs with... Uh, Saturday afternoon session. Yeah. And, and how old uh, were you then? Oh, I was 20-something. That's like unbelievable. That. 20. And then... Um, uh, oh, Mickey Roker was the drummer. Uh, and, uh, you know, of course, I was a nervous wreck anyway. But... Uh, uh, so those two, And then... 
That was in 1968, I can tell you that. And then uh, um, R. Blakey was getting a new band. The old band didn't know this stuff. I didn't know. But R. Blakey, um, uh, our, Woody was doing something with Art Blakey, I guess. So uh, Art Blakey asked Woody, Woody Shaw, to to uh, find, get a piano player. Or, and uh, Woody pulled my coat. Woody said, hey, come on, I want, you, I want you to have this gig with Art Blakey. So, uh, 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 said, Billy Harper was still there. Well, Billy Harper was with the old band and he was in the new band. And uh, Buster Williams played the bass in that, so that's how I met Buster in that band. Was that, Ramon Morris in that band? Not, not till later. Not later, later. Uh, uh, so, no, I mean, Billy Harper, Ramon Morris. Yeah, Harper, right. Not, <laughs> uh, and there was a trombonist, I just can't remember his name. Um, but we played, we got, got the slugs and we played the first night, that Tuesday night. And... Uh, we started on time. I always had a reputation of being not quite on time. And uh, uh, so we started playing, and we were in the middle of the set when the old band came in. Because they knew the routine, our routine, here you show up maybe, the, or whatever, it was 9.30, it was just all for 10. So uh, I can remember sitting on a bandstand and seeing the old band come in, to look to play the gig. So I hadn't told them that they were... This is wonderful. <laughs> this is a wonderful situation. <laughs> so I remember getting a couple of looks from from down there from a couple of the old band uh, guys, band members. So I'm saying to myself, I'm not leaving this bandstand. I don't care what happens. I'm not going anywhere. So... Um, but that uh, was your that, really that was your first that was major my, gig. That was yeah, that was it. And then uh, uh, I remember at the end of the night something really nice happened. I didn't feel like I had acquitted myself well that well. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and you know I sat there and started playing the piano. So Billy Harper, who likes to play the drums, he got up and started playing the drums. So I looked up at me and said, "Hey, you don't have anything to prove. You're a messenger now." So he couldn't have said anything better to me. Um, hmm. when, when you were in the studio, I mean, and, and granted, I mean, this talking to a cat who's been on thousands of sessions, but speaking about like Freddie or Woody, um, I remember when, uh, when Kenny Barron was invited up by Youssef Latif, uh, he wrote, he wanted a couple of tunes that Kenny uh, had written Kenny didn't play on the on the album, but but he got to go to the session, and it was all the cats: Richard Davis and Yusef, and I mean a myriad of cats. And really, it was the creative control was completely in the hands of the musicians. Mm. The producer uh, basically stay out of it. I mean, and I wanted to know about the approach of the studio of you guys, whether it was a CTI session with Freddie or Woody, how much creative control the musicians had. I know, like for instance, like Woody. The, all this stuff was in his head. But as a group, I mean, it's an oral tradition. The music is an oral tradition. To me, was it created like that in the studio? Well, no. I mean, we had stuff. We had rehearsals. I mean, I had two pieces on, say, Blackstone Legacy, which was the first... Uh, think on Me. Uh, yeah, Think on Me and New World. Uh, and um, uh, so it was... With us, basically, the producer was there. It was Lester Koenig. Right. It's a great, you know, people used to describe him as the only honest man in the music business. Uh, and he. It's a big shout out to John, who's watching right now. <laughs> <laughs> there were a lot of good yeah. cast, so they loved them. I guess they yeah. just stood for the music. I don't think they cared if they sold a million copies. They knew what their well, label I mean, stood you, for. You have to make your money back. I mean, yeah. you know, but but the thing was that I can remember is the only time that ever happened to me. I had a piece of New World that had a part that was sort of uh, funky, you know. And the thing is, okay, well, uh, or it had the rhythm, the beat was, the, the, the harmony was different, was still out there. But uh, uh, it came out after the first, hey, George, do you think you could stretch out a little more? 
I was really surprised because usually people would the, the producer would say, hey, can you, you know. This I love it, dude. He wanted you to stretch out more. So that's great. You know, that, uh, but uh, I always felt that with the less, uh, uh, there, was a, there was more of a musical commitment than anything else. And uh, uh, I loved him for that. Um, Creed Taylor the same way. Creed used to let the cats stretch out and play. He knew the well, best. Creed knew. Creed had his ideas. I mean, he would come out and he wouldn't say anything to band. He'd say something to the band leader. Dig. He just said he was in his ears. And he was more of a. I think no, he wanted that to happen, allow it to happen. But I think Creed wanted to uh, be uh, take control when he felt necessary and. And uh, uh, use the personnel that he wanted to use. You know, if he wanted, if he preferred uh, that Freddie use Ron uh, or, or uh, Keith, uh, some uh, rather than use his own band. So Freddie finally, with CTI, got to use his own band and keep your soul together. Well, I mean, there's, uh, people are are asking. Uh, could could you could you play something for the audience? They they they're jonesing for you to play. Oh, they didn't hear me play. Oh, they, they they want they don't want me to talk. They don't want me to ask you questions. They want to hear oh, you. Play. Okay, yeah, first yeah. of all, the people out there, I want to say something. Go ahead. I want to say thank you to all the people who sent me gifts and uh, words of encouragement uh, during my mm. me, you know my medical crisis here. And uh, uh, that was really, that, that was very, very important to me and uh, was very helpful to me. And I appreciate that to no end. And I just got a new CD. I was able to get to most of the strength to do a new <laughs> CD. Uh, um, and it's called I'm All Smiles. And it's dedicated to all those, well, to everybody, but especially those people who uh, who sent me all that encouragement uh, and were with me during the uh, uh, during that during that crisis. So did you feel? Did you feel? Were you being lifted up? Could you feel? Oh, you were absolutely! Happy? Yeah, so beautiful. You know, I was really surprised. I mean, there were, you know, I can say that at least not more than one tear came to my eye. <laughs> Uh, so I was really, really thanks, and I'm really, I'm glad I have this opportunity. Do it to do this to say that. To, so thank you so much for that. Well, okay. play whatever you feel, George. Okay, we, we, people love there, you around the world. They love you, man. I'm sorry, but the piano is a bit out. Yeah, just knock it back so. and bang it back. <laughs>
Yeah. Thank you. 
you used the word before, uh, the word mission, a musical mission. It was a, I, I often talk about it as a calling. But can you talk about the calling for music for you or the mission, however, however you want to define it? But for younger cats out there, it's not... What, what were your intentions for getting into music? Oh, well, you know, it's something that develops, and I think that you, for me anyway, uh, I always knew that I, I loved music. There was a time I wanted to be a baseball player or an actor or, or nothing like a doctor or maybe a lawyer, but, <laughs> <laughs> but not serious. Yeah, right. No law school. But, but it was, uh, so music was always in my life. And as I went to high school, I went to the High School of Performing Arts. And I think that's, uh, that was a school, that was an arts high school. Now it's called the LaGuardia School in New York. It was this great school that had, uh, you majored in music, drama, or dance. And uh, a sister school, Music and Art, was further uptown. We were in Midtown, 46th Street, between 6th and 7th Avenues. And... Uh, I didn't know anything about jazz at all. I, did, I knew I loved music. And I loved the camaraderie of being... It's the only school I've ever gone to where at the end of the school year, people would cry, you know, and then... It was like a, they, they, missed, they were going to miss oh, each other. Oh, so yeah, like, yeah, right, yeah. And then at the beginning, you know, when it was time to go back to school, everybody was so eager just to go back. And it's not like, um, you know, it was a school that was in Manhattan. So I didn't live in Manhattan. Uh, and many of the people didn't, but even the people who knew each other, uh, who lived in, uh, I mean, I have friends who were, uh, who lived, who went to the school, who who I knew outside of the school that, that uh, were close enough where we could see each other, but most everybody was, you know, was uh, far away, as to say, in other boroughs. Um, but even for those people who were close to each other, when we got back to school, it was, it was okay, this is where we're supposed to be. This is, uh, and it was an exciting experience. And I think uh, being around like-minded people, that is people in the arts who are, love the arts. And I mean, it's, you were there and so when you went there, you didn't know everything about the arts. That was a school, it was a learning experience. You got in class, outside of class. Uh, we get tickets to, I remember getting tickets to, uh, uh, what was it, Jamaica, uh, on Broadway Musical with Lena Horne. Wow, and I rest went, in peace. Yeah, and I went, I met her uh, after, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> uh, at an intermission during, I mean, after, after the show, we went back and that was, that was great. Uh, and I got to see shows like Once a Mile, What's Upon a Mattress, West Side Story, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, we got to know things, learn things about each other, about each other as people, uh, and about, you know, people would bring different musical experiences to the school. That's where I first started to learn about jazz, you know, to get familiar with, uh, with, with jazz, it was right there. And, uh, you know, uh, there are people, you know, different disciplines. The dance discipline was, was really <laughs> different from us. And uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, theater discipline was great. We were right in the theater district. So, so, so being in that, that kind of mindset, it gives you, put you in a kind of a mindset. And also, you know, I met people there that introduced me to jazz. That, Later on, you know, introduced me to Thelonious Monk. So that when I was 18 and in New York, the legal age was 18 at that time, we could go to um, the five spot sure. and see Thelonious. And he was there like months at a time. <laughs> see Thelonious Monk with a double bill. Maybe Mose Allison was playing opposite him. Or see Mingus and more about Waldron, who the opposite. Or see uh, Rossan Roland Kirk at the time. At the time, it was just Roland Kirk. Uh, 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 and I could see, oh God, Coleman Hawkins would come in with this big beard, you know, that time. Uh, or see somebody sit in. I remember being with my friend. He was kind of educating me, giving me a jazz education. And, um, 
and I saw somebody, this guy got up, you know, he was kind of dressed, well, you know, it was clean, but he just looked like somebody who just came in, you know. Right, was, just off the uh, street, yeah. yeah. So, but, you know, he, he just picked up the bass and started playing, and I just smiled. And I said, Gee, everybody around. <laughs> <laughs> said, no, man, this will be where. Oh, uh, man. Legendary uh, cat. Uh, Legend. Wow. Uh, but so it, 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 was, it was heroic, regular people that you were seeing play this incredible, soaring music. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it was regular people, but and it wasn't, it wasn't. Right, right. Because the people that I met at, at this school, you know, were regular people, but... They, but they were, they were, but they weren't. You know, there was some other kind of commitment and uh, direction there in the arts. Uh, uh, Murray Pariah, I don't know if you know, the classical pianist, great classical pianist, went there for a short time. Uh, 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 I remember there was a young Korean pianist, her name was Jung Ja Kim. Remember when she came to school? She didn't really speak English, but she played the piano great. <laughs> <laughs> the universal language. She, she was a very, 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 very nice person. Yeah. Uh, uh, was there was it multidisciplinary? Like, were you playing for dancers and 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 uh, theater? I didn't know the dancers said there was a pianist for the dancers. You know, but uh, no, um, I was just in some ways I was overwhelmed. But this is where uh, I, you know, got my entry into not just uh, music, music, just the discipline of music, but the life in the arts in general, you know, uh, in the performing arts in general. Uh, and that's, that was so important. I, I started playing a viola and... Uh, in the school, you know, the first thing. I don't know how this happened, though. They gave us a, you know, gave us the instrument, put us in a string orchestra. I sat up there, put a, something on like a cleft, a, a C cleft, an alto cleft. I'd never seen. And then, okay, this Ina Klein and Nock music. Boom. This is the D string, this is G, this is bum, 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 bum. And next thing we know, we're playing. Right. I don't know how that happened. But, uh, um, no time to think, really. You just, I mean, you had, you, they just kind of put you in it and, and yeah. put you in the, in the deep end and let you go. Well, no, they, they did give us, I just don't remember exactly. I remember the viola getting the viola and I take it home. My father hated it. <laughs> he said, you bring that? What'd you choose that for? Uh, but, uh, uh, like, like, uh, you, Billy, in our last Billy Cobb in our last interview, talked about this place on Broadway. He said it was like eighteen fifty Broadway, and that might not be the right address. He couldn't remember, but it was like Saturday morning rhythm sections. And Grady Tate, oh, Grady oh, Tate would be oh, that Ro was much that was that later. was later. But I'm saying like what it, what what did Roland Hanna, for instance, like what well, were those guys? Those guys I were didn't put see, now. Roland for me, I had another experience with Roland, where he hooked me up with a vocal coach. I had to do an audition with Roland. He had to approve. So uh -huh. I was with the vocal coach. He said, well, I need a pianist to just help me with the vocals. So I had to go to Roland and say, okay, well, I'll help you. And I'll get <laughs> so I went to Roland and Roland somehow I got And I started, uh, um, I, I started working for this vocal coach. And he had this technique he would use for pitches so that they could, you know, for intervals. Anyway, that, that was what my... But, what you're talking about Clint Houston, is yeah, is something called Rhythm Associates, which was Chris White and Rudy Collins actually started. That was the rhythm section for Dizzy Gillespie, and uh, they started that. Now, when I went, we went as a rhythm section. I think we might have been the first. We heard about it. So, yeah, let's go. Man. Yeah, Billy, you, and Clint. Yeah. No. So they said, you know, rhythm section. They were just thinking about the bass and the drums. And I showed up. They said, oh, yeah, piano. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> so next thing you know, Larry Willis was there. And he, wow, was, love the uh, guys. he uh, was a big influence on me and uh, uh, a great mentor to me. Not just then and there, but elsewhere as well. And um, Life coach kind of too? No, 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 no life coach. But, uh, 
But he's a be, he's a great cat. I love that he man. He's a gifted yeah. cat yeah. with an expression. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, and also, you know, he's a way of telling you things that he's a good teacher because he can tell you things that encapsulate things. Listen, you do this, that's good, but you can do well and, and get right to the point so you and it speak to you, you know. And uh, and believe it or not, Joe Chambers also was there. And because Joe plays the piano, so he could coach a piano as well. Wow! Is Joe is doing vocal. Co Joe, not vocal, uh, piano, and and uh, drums, and uh, sometimes uh, uh, oh, I can see his face. Uh, it'll come. It'll come. No, I, the, the, this. The, the, what was? Because I mean, those guys had played Ed all Thigpen night. Also, Thigpen. Uh, that was an experience. I gotta say this about Ed Thigpen. You know, I knew him from. Uh, you know, from listening from listening to the Oscar oh, sure. Peterson trio yeah. was Ray Brown. And then when he came in and played, he played completely different. <laughs> you know, he was, just, he was on know, fire. You know, so that other thing he was doing with the gig required for for OP. Now, um uh oh God, I, I, that other name That horn player. Uh, the, 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 he was let me see, he was one of the, was he on on uh, was he? Uh, I mean, Eric Dolphy. That was an Eric Dolphy record uh, called "Out to Lunch." I'm trying to think if he was on that as well. If there was another lead player. Oh my God! In front of that, I know uh, Bobby was on there. Well, maybe he was on Spring. Uh, but he also did a, a, a Miles Davis uh, record in Europe, alive. Uh, uh, but I can see his face. His, his name is just not coming to my. Tom. He's an alto player? Or, or? No, no, he played uh, uh, t uh, tenor. Well, if the audience knows, they can try to help us out. I'm, I'm sort of hitting a... Um, the, the, what was the thing that... Rhythm Associates, is that that's what it was? Rhythm Associates, that was uh, uh, Chris... What was their goal? Rhythm. Like, what did, was their the goal? Their goal was trying to teach you how to play in a rhythm section. How to bring, you know, play like a rhythm section. Play and interact like a rhythm section. How do you do that? And also, you know, I mean, I wasn't limited to that. Of course, you got, if I got a coach like Larry Willis, you know, I'm getting other things out of this as well, <laughs> voicings and how you play. So, okay, I noticed you like to use pentatonic scales a lot, you know. You know, or, you know, you play, you, uh, something about, about, I'm trying to remember how he said it. Well, one of the things that always stuck with me. He said, don't play everything, try to play everything you know every time you play. Uh, right, right, uh, you know, right. Uh, don't throw the whole kitchen sink there. Um, but, you know, he had a, a, a way of touching the piano as well. He had a great touch. And he has a great touch and a great harmonic sense. I mean, a great harmonic sense. And I was, you know, every time I hear him play, I was, I'm reminded of that. The last time I saw him play was at um, uh, Lincoln Center, at uh, Jazz at Lincoln Center, at, in the uh, um, Appel, was it the Appel, I think, uh, where uh, um, Roy Hargrove's uh, memorial kind of, uh, was, it's so five hours long, of it. and he played, I remember him playing Nature Boy, and wow. I, nobody had to tell me that that was his reharmonization because uh, he has a great, great harmonic imagination oh, yeah, and, I, and I, harmonic sense. The, the, uh, did you ever, like, I guess when I talked to Chuck Rainey and, and so many other cats, they... A lot of them played for free. A lot of times, they just wanted. They just played and played and played. I mean, they'd play for some little money. They'd play for free. And they, you know, I mean, did, was that the, is that the calling too? I mean, did you play oh, a lot yeah, of? Yeah, I mean, you play. It is not about okay. We gotta play to make the money. All right, you right. Play. Part of the money of getting the money is not just getting you know like get the money, but it's part of partly you know the respect. But but then you know you go to play to play. That's the most important thing is to play. Whether you're making money or not, you need to play. Uh, you can practice at home 24 hours a day. If you can go out sleep, you can practice, but it's not going to be the same. It's not going to give you that same experience as when you play with somebody, for, or, and especially playing with somebody on a gig. 
um, you you uh, are playing with people is is uh, I mean that's one thing I really get out of that. And I must say, for me, I you know sort of came up playing in the rhythm section, and for me my ambition I just want to be able to. I always felt like I was playing catch up, so I I. I was just happy to be any role, you know. If I was in baseball, I'd be happy to be the bat boy, <laughs> you know. But I, but I could be in the band. You mean I get to play? I mean I get to sit at the piano while these guys are playing. I got the best seat in the house, and I can contribute and learn at the same time. That's the word is contribute. Yeah. You know, so um, that that was that was a thing. I mean. Uh, the Samaritans, Jazz Samaritans, are brilliant. I mean, Bernard Scavell is Chicago now. He would have been with George, learn your standards. Learn, learn your standards. Uh, um, and, uh, uh, you know, the different thing you, you, you know, going through learning the songs, learning your pieces, and discovering music together, uh, and playing together. So, I never felt, and even listening to, like, for listening, I listen to Oscar, listen to Monk, but my focus in listening when I listened to the piano was listening to the music, not, not the instrument. You know, uh, there are other things, you know, this, how do you play if you could get that, make that music? So uh, I would, uh, like, m my biggest influences, I would say, probably were Miles Davis and John Coltrane. Uh, because you know their music, they they didn't just play and have you know side a backup band or play, or when they plugged in a somebody else in the band or a new band, you know got some new guys in the band. They said, okay, they got to play the music this way or that way. Everybody in that band had a had a strong influence on the music. Right. So, I mean, uh, uh, when the band, when, McC when uh, Winton Kelly wasn't there, when Red Garland wasn't there, when Rick Winton Kelly was there, things were different. And, uh, when, uh, um, Jimmy Cobb, Jimmy Cobb the Elvin, and, yep. and, and Philly Joe. Yeah, Philly Joe, right. You know, Things would things were uh, things changed, and when Herbie and Tony came, and Ron Carter and George Coleman and Wayne Shorter, then things changed. The music changed, and the thing about that is not trying to make the music happen so much as allowing the music to happen. Uh, and with Train, you know, he got the right guys, and you could hear everybody develop. Mm. Uh, in those days, and speaking about that, uh, just brought to yeah, me, really, yeah. I can hear. Remember Chick, hearing Chick go uh, in, sound like Horace, and sound like like Winton and Kelly, and hear uh, um, sound like like uh, Herbie and then McCoy Tyner, and then all of a sudden, you know, so wait a minute, <laughs> I hear you know, hear Chick, you know, I hear his truth, Chick Corea, I hear him. You know, you hear that grows. That was a very exciting time and and a very exciting to, uh, uh, experience to hear musicians grow. I chose. Uh, I mentioned Chick because that was uh, that was really. Uh, he was somebody that you got to see yeah, and hear, see and you and yeah. And people know Chick and, and probably have experienced. Uh, you know, are able to experience. The develop his development from wherever they came. Um, oh, well, no, but I I need this is so important for people that are going to see this in fifty years. Um, in those workshops with uh, with Rudy and, and and Grady and 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 they taught you about you said learning how to play as a rhythm section and. I, I've asked all the cats this, and I wanted to get your feedback on it, is how responsible are rhythm sections for creating new musical vocabulary? Very important. Rhythm section, you know, a part of the band. You know, you learn to work as a rhythm section, but then, really, you are, you know, you, you're part of the band. It's we, 
we came up with an algorithm section. We'd be tight. We'd be talking to each other what we want to do, how you. We learned, and especially then, it was those two rhythm sections that I mentioned the, the Elvin, Jimmy Garrison, and McCoy, and Herbie, and Ron, and, and Tony. You know, those were so. They were, you could tell that they were special just because I could only mention their first names. You know, and you know what I'm talking about. Still. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, so, but so so how do based on the um on the as Ron Carter would say the the soloists bringing their kitchen solos to the gig, <laughs> how do you merge the how does the rhythm section help elevate that to, to new vocabulary? Well, they you know they can come and and uh, use some of the terms of that uh, motifs that, that they hear. Also, you know, give them direction by. By what you, by what you play, how you play the foundation you give them. You are the foundation. So uh, when you listen to a record like Miles Davis, My Funny Valentine, Miles Lila, Coney Hawk, My Funny Valentine, that one you hear that rhythm section play, uh, turn like Stella by Starlight, Inside Out, you know, play, and everything that they do. It's very logical, harmonically, you know. <laughs> That's one thing about when playing the piano, playing jazz, is you better know some theory, especially if you're in the rhythm section. If you're a bass player, if you're a pianist, you know, know some theory, you know. And Ron talks about it, it's about finding the right notes. You know, that's what it's about. Because Ron doesn't play just the body, just the roots. He plays melodic. Oh, song, yeah. Hey. And he plays, you know, like with a sense of direction, where are things going? You know, where do you want to be? Where you, and the rhythm section played with that. So when you're a rhythm section, you can change, you can set the groove, you can uh, uh, vary the intensity, you can uh, um, uh, not change the tempo, but drop the play, play half time, you know, and uh, Set the cushion, give them something to play for. Okay, boom, here it is. Now, we got you something. You need to deal with that. Uh, uh, so. Uh, but you can also turn standard tunes inside out. I mean, I think that that's the most. Well, I mean, not even standard tunes. I mean, the, all tunes. Yeah, all tunes, yeah. Uh, and that's another thing I like to say. It's one of my musical. The one thing that I. One of the things I love about playing this music is that. Um, you know, you become, when you're playing a, a Gershwin piece, a, uh, Ellington, an Ellington piece, a, a Bill Evans piece, a Herbie Hancock piece, a Wayne Shorter piece, whatever piece you're playing, when you play, especially in a, a small group, you become a co-composer, you know. Because you got the theme, you have, well, and then when you're talking about the development, there you go, uh, and how you perceive. You know, when you look at a piece of paper, you see these chords are written. Okay, those are the chords, but you know, those that's on the page. The music doesn't happen on the page. <laughs> music happens out here, you know, and and uh, 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 you know those chords are. I mean, they have, when you see them, you see the harmony, and you look at it, when I look at it, I'm going to say, okay, what does that mean? Does that mean I'm actually going to play, like if I see a C minus 6, something, you know, basically, I see a C minus 6. Does that mean I'm going to play a C minus 6? Or does it mean I'm going to play an F7? Does it mean I'm going to play a C, an A half diminished? Am I going to play, you know, what does that mean? And also, where are these things going? So, where are they going? Knowing so, uh, the direction, it's a, there's a direction of knowing where you're going. Yeah, and what is what is the basis plan? What is their plan? Uh, so the harmonies that I see on the page, uh, I mean, to me, they're like, you know, you have to know about what they apply. You know, what is, what does it mean? It's not just okay, this is it. It's not. I mean, I don't want it to be there because sometimes when you see an a minor, maybe you want it to be an E flat or an A cell, you know, or sometimes it's going to interpret. So it's about the color and the direction. So for me, chords 
are not just chords, but they're colors, they can make colors, they can be chords, they can be, you know, but there's, they are so, there's so much, they, they, they tell you, they're telling you something about a piece and what you could do, what the, what the piece could be, where is it going, where are you coming from. Before my phone battery dies, this has been such an enlightening discussion, um, but I just want you to talk to the audience out there, um, how you've always continued to look towards the light and be mm -hmm. positive in the face of what, what could be considered adversity. Well, I don't know. You know, if you want to do what you want to do, you have to just, whatever happens, do something to deal with. But first, I'd like to say, my mother was very much that way. My mother would wake up and, good morning. Right. You know, just happy. Yeah. Whatever you do. If you want to do something, this is what you have to do. And if something happens over here, oh, well, I got to do this in order to do this. Okay. So... Sometimes it's not. I'm not saying that I don't have my down moments. That I don't. Well, you're a human being. I mean, of course you do. You know, you know I'm depressed or. You know, but, but the big in the big picture, you know, what do you want to do? You know, what do you, you just? There are times I can I can tell you that before, for instance, before this, uh, I, I had this amputation. I. Uh, there were, uh, I was dealing with leg ulcers, open wound, a lot of pain. And I, there were times I, I was really depressed, lost a lot of weight. And and I thought maybe, well, maybe this is it. You know, if I don't eat, if I've lost my appetite, maybe that's for a reason, you know. And um, there were, you know, good things that happened that, Kind of pull me out of out of a funk, you know that I that, uh, that I was in, and you know, because there are times you uh, you just you know you get beat down, yeah. and then you know sometimes you say, okay, I'm on the ropes, I'll take it for a while. <laughs> you know, the rope and dope, rope and just so, take it, man. Uh, what, what what do you mean those things? It's not just music; it's it, it can be any kind of thing that pulls you out. In life, you know, anything in life. But music, the, I, I think I've ha I have a big advantage because music is in my life. And it's been uh, uh, so much to me, you know. It's given me so, so, so much. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, like, there are people around me, mm. uh, you know, that, uh, you know, where I live, kind of can be a little isolated, but... Um, um, I get I have friends that are that are great that are love and caring and uh, uh, and positive uh, uh, and and I and I found that I <laughs> through this experience that I have more friends than I ever imagined you know uh, so um, all that. I mean, I feel very, very, very fortunate. I mean, other things, I can tell you the things that, a couple of the things, you know, I was on dialysis for five years, I had a couple of transplants, kidney liver transplants, you know, going through a bunch of stuff. But those were just, you know, other people do that. Well, but you, what you I'm said, but, but, and the idea was that you said, I have, okay, so, okay, you lost your legs. Right, I mean, you had oh, well, just one, just one, but now it's like so. Okay, well, I, I okay, I don't have the use of that leg, and I still have to find my way to the gig. But I'm not going to let that stop me from getting to oh, play. No. You know what I'm saying? Oh you, no, I mean, it's doing to do the house. I had to do the house three times a week, four hours, four hours each time. Uh, I did. I chose to do hemodialysis that dialysis rather than uh, 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 I can't think of the word. Uh, the dialysis that you that uh, that uh, um, the basis uh, the scene. All right. Um, 
Uh, the, you chose uh, the hemo one, though. Yeah. So I, rather than, uh, the, you know, to put in your, your the cavity, so you have to do that every day. But uh, there are drugs. But I cho chose to do the hemo because I do it three times a week. The rest of the week, okay, I'm normal. Uh, I can, I mean, it's just that I can only drink. I wasn't supposed to have more than a liter a day of fluids. That means all fluids. All fluids. Yeah. So, uh, and that means like if it's, uh, uh, I count like with if it's ice cream or fruit. And the ice cream I couldn't have because I had to watch the dairy because of a lot of phosphorus, you know. But doing that and going on the road, finding places to go, that was, that was a trip. But, you know, <laughs> that, was, that was just something I got to do. That was like the price of doing business. You know, so, um, and, and I was very fortunate, again, because the technicians at the dialysis unit that I went to were really great. And they, when I, before I, my doctor said something about dialysis, I, I saw something like, I thought it was going to be something like an iron lung. You know, I'm going to be laying here. But, no, well, it was okay, I'm in a recliner. Watch TV. Okay, I can call it. You drained when you come out, but so what? So did you? Did you like when John heard uh, had cancer? He never practiced before that, and then after cancer, he couldn't even so weak he couldn't even pick up a pencil, and so he started to practice. Did, did you lose? Did you, did you have a oh, physical? Man. Well, I can tell you, coming back from the hospital. Uh, well, first of all, his age. So I, when I get older, you know, now I got to, every day I do this exercise, you know. I get, before I used to, you know, being on the road, no problem. Go to the gig, no problem. I like, uh, don't have a gig for a couple of weeks, no problem. All right. But um, now uh, I do the, but coming back from, uh, actually from dialysis, from being in the hospital, I was there like the first time, 18 days. And... Didn't touch the piano, and it was. I had to, you know, like get back to, uh, you know, I played like a drunken sailor. <laughs> you know, <laughs> my piano. I got there. You didn't. You 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 did not have a lot of fine. Have any <laughs> yeah. fine motor control? Yeah. Yeah, that was difficult, and I could play. You know, coming back from. I was in uh, the hospital for about two weeks, and then I was in rehab for about two weeks. That was rehab for living without, you know, well, that was before, way before prosthesis. And um, so uh, you, you get uh, uh, therapy, and uh, occupational therapy, which really is about, it's about how you deal with um, it's physical therapy. Just it's daily physical. living. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. Physical, the occupational therapy. Absolutely. So how are you going to deal with work in the kitchen with one leg and how are you going to do all that? So, um, I was, uh, uh, acute therapy. That was pretty quick. I was out in a little less than two weeks. So, say that was a month all told. And I got to the piano and I could play a little bit. There was, but I was lucky because in rehab, there was a piano in one of the rooms. So, I mean, I couldn't play all day, but... Uh, wow. Maybe, or maybe, uh, maybe I get a half an hour in occasionally, if that much, you know, because other people are using this room, too. You know. oh, I'm sure they would have enjoyed it. You know, well, I mean, we, I, I, I mean, it's a miracle that my battery still has life. I just want you to finish um, Free Associate Art Pepper. Art Pepper. Uh, I have a lot to thank Art Pepper for. Uh, I love the Art Pepper. He was a bit eccentric. Uh, he was a different kind of guy. You read his bio. Uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. And at the end of, like in the mid by the, by the time you finish the second page, you should be able to get what this is, where this is going. Uh, but uh, we got to be close and we got to trust and. Uh, uh, um, a great relationship, you know. Uh, I, I like Dart a lot. Uh, we we would uh, just hang together, and uh, we uh, 
Uh, sometimes we had similar vices, you know, we could understand that, or we had had, had, had experience with them, had experience with some, some, some similar. Not sure, sure. Well, he movie lost. Movie. He lost a huge part of his prime of his career because of. Yeah, well, uh, he was. He was in prison for quite a while. You know, and and that's that. That to me is is the salvation, George. I mean, you're still here, man. Yeah, well, I didn't have to do go all the and it wasn't like all. Oh, you know, I said I I didn't do all the things that I did, but. Uh, no. Uh, but I, some of them, but. Uh, What's his significance to to music in your mind? His? Yeah. Oh, he was a great. He was a great creative uh, saxophonist. The great. Uh, he uh, uh, had a great uh, lyricism. He knew how to play a song and get the most out of the song. You know, he could get deep into a piece, play a melody, and make you cry. Um, uh, and uh, he, he he was about playing, but playing with people was very important to him. You know, it wasn't just playing, and uh, and he would always give me a lot of space to play. But you know, um, he liked to interact. He liked to you know like to feel, you know, like to have that support and know that you were with him, because you know as he started out in the, the as he started out. Uh, you know, his mom tried to get, you know, didn't want to have his try. You know, at the end of one of those paragraphs before he hit the second page, you know, his mother had been trying to, to get rid of That's him. That's right. So he says, uh, I was born, she lost. Uh, so <laughs> 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 he was fighting before he even got out of the He boat. was tough, man. You I mean, uh, so, uh, beautiful, man. You know, he was yeah. Was there a sense of urgency, like, with that music, and, and any of that? I mean, it, uh, yeah, I mean, yes. I yeah. would say that definitely for him. Yeah. Uh, there was definitely, it's because he, he needed to play. Uh, I, I think, you know, he really needed to play. And I think Laurie uh, uh, encouraged him to play the, the clarinet. Uh, and he had his own, very own sound, very distinct sound on the clarinet, a very woody sound, very nice sound uh, on the clarinet. Uh, so uh, Art was really a very giving person, but he was also very wary of you, uh, of, of people, you know, of the surroundings. You know. he, he, what your intentions were and, and you know, if well, they... The people, yeah, yeah, I mean, because, you know, in L.A., he grew up during that time when uh, uh, in L.A. when it was really segregated, and uh, uh, you know there was a white union, black union, and and guys. Uh, uh, so he felt sometimes you know he knew how it went on, and he loved uh, uh, music, but he loved the way black musicians played as well, you know. Black, but black musicians, play. but he was, um, you know, because you know, he spent time in prison as well. So you know that 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 really uh, uh, accents accentuates the the um, the, uh, uh, the, the segregation of uh, society, you know, society segregation, and how you have to survive in prison. So that's really really serious there. So being on the inside, being on the outside, that was a thing, you know, uh, um, feeling uh, and being being around during uh, the time that uh, the civil rights, um, people were more aware of the civil rights and a time of an organization called Osran Karenga Panthers that... Uh, oh, the US organization, absolutely. Yeah, and yeah, Tume was part of that, yeah. yeah. That, uh, you know, you say, well, wow, man. <laughs> you, can, you can understand people being pissed off a lot. Yeah, you're right. His perspective but, was broad. Yeah, but, yeah. But, but he, he, you know, so he was concerned. Well, uh, sometimes you'd be a Billy Higgins and Tony Dumas. You know, Tony's a very quiet guy. And he, which he would hang with. He felt very comfortable with... with, uh, with um, Art. Uh, oh, no, very comfortable with Billy Higgins. 
And so they would hang out all the time, and those was the time they were wearing dashikis too. So I said, well, you didn't know how to take that. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but, you know, I was, for me, on Carl Burnett, who was in the band, Carl was, was, was always a warm person, always so very supportive. The best, I love him. Uh, and David, David Williams was there, and the same with him. So that was, um, uh, I felt very comfortable with this combination of people. George Cables, um, we will do part two very soon. I have more to ask you, but uh, thank you for inspiring people around the I world told today. You everything man. I knew. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, brother. Thank you. All right. This is the Jake Feinberg Show. See you later.